so I am Lace. I am going to be presenting on data DevOps for the modern data warehouse in Azure. So just a little bit about me. I'm a senior software engineer as part of the commercial software engineering team at Microsoft. I am based in Melbourne, and my specialization is around data, specifically around Spark and Databricks. Um, so there's my GitHub and Twitter if you want to reach me. Um, OK, so agenda for today, very simple. So I'll start off with an overview of the modern data warehouse. What, this, what is this? What kind of patterns are we proposing from the Microsoft side? And also, more importantly, how you actually operationalize a data pipeline. And I'll also be talking about learnings that we, we found along the way, along with best practices from working with customers. OK, so modern data warehouse. So before I talk about actually the data warehouse inside of it, I want to talk about the analytics. So from, because this is essentially the why, the reason you actually do data warehousing. So from left to right, we have descriptive analytics, which is essentially asks the question, what happened? It answers the question, what happened? Essentially, for example, your sales, what was my sales from the last month? And then you have diagnostic analytics, which answers the question, why did it happen? So perhaps my sales for last month was quite low because a specific store didn't perform in, in, uh, as expected. And then we go into the realm of predictive analytics. What, what will happen in the future? Wh what will my sales be in the next month or the next quarter? And finally, we have prescriptive analy analytics, which, me which tries to ask the question or answer the question, how can we make it happen? Like, what are the certain steps that we can take in order to actually increase sales for next quarter? Now, you can imagine as the value of these analytics increase, so does the difficulty of actually implementing these. The first two analytics have a very top-down approach. That is, you typically start with your fact and dimension tables, the reports that you have in mind that you want to create, and then you populate this with data. Well, the, the previous, oops, the, the second two analytics has a very bottom-up approach. That is, you don't necessarily know which data sets are going to be useful for your machine learning models, perhaps, that your data scientist has to actually do some exploratory analysis so you have to gather all this data so for your data scientists to use, and then they'll probably figure out, oh, these are the certain data sets we're going to be reporting on. So it's a very bottom-up approach of actually building your data pipelines. The traditional data warehouse would get you as far as the first two analytics, but really, to get through all the four analytics, you have to have a different pattern, which uh, we call the modern data warehouse. Okay, so the folks who are coming from a data warehousing uh, background, this should be very, very familiar. You have your typical sources from the, from the left side, which are usually relational stores, maybe a bunch of flat files. You have an extract, transform, load process, your ETL process, which basically transfor it, uh, transforms this into your fact and dimension tables in your warehouse. You might have a staging database in the middle that will facilitate this. This could be a schema within your data warehouse. And then finally, you have your reports, which get, trans which get populated typically from your data warehouse. We want to transform this, um, this traditional data warehouse into the modern data warehouse architecture. And the modern data warehouse architecture fundamentally revolves around the concept of a data lake, which is essentially the response to this, this explosion of data sets, right? So you no longer just have relational data sets. You have speech, video, um, sound, all of this coming into your data lake that a, that a relational based data pipeline no longer fits the bill. So typically, you'd have some sort of ingestion mechanism, so something that actually moves your data into your data lake. You need to have some sort of exploratory um, uh, tool so that your data scientist or your analyst can actually query the stuff that in your data lake. And of course, you need to have some sort of analytics engine that so that you can actually transform, prep, cleanse, or train machine learning models on top of your data. Finally, you need some sort of serving layer so that the serving layer can be used by the downstream consumers, such as BI, reporting, and so on. So this is what it looks like when we slap on some Azure services on top of the different components here. So typically, data factory is your go-to ingestion mechanism, along with your orchestration mechanism. And then you have Databricks, which is an, a managed Apache Spark platform. Um, that's available in Azure, where you can, as for, for folks who are familiar with Spark, Spark is essentially a, a distributed computing engine, which has a very, very rich set of APIs you can use to transform your data, train machine learning models, and so on. 
or you can use SQL Data Warehouse with a technology called Polybase, which essentially allows you to query files that's sitting in your data lake, that's if it was just a SQL table. And for prepping and training, you, uh, there's also Databricks, but there's also HD Insight. If your company is already quite invested in the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, HD In Insight is essentially a, a managed Hadoop platform that you can utilize. And for the serving layer, there's a myriad of different services. I've only added a few of them over here. So obviously the, the most common one is Azure SQL. There's also all the major open source databases that's available <coughs> on a past service like Postgres and MySQL, if that's what you're using in your company. And you have the MPP style da databases such as the SQL Data Warehouse. And all of this fundamentally, uh, the, the one of the core components of this sit on top of Data Lake Gen 2. So Data Lake Gen 2 is a layer on top of blob storage. However, it's optimized for big data workloads. It gives you file level and folder level security along with a hierarchical namespace. Okay. So there's much to be said of how you actually structure your data in your data lake, but I like to think about them in different tiers. And I've seen this very, uh, in one form in another in, diff in multiple customers. So typically you would structure your first data, uh, the first sort of portion of your data lake dedicated to your bronze data sets. These are your raw, unprocessed data sets that you've just landed in your data lake. And then you have your silver data sets. These are semi-transformed, cleansed, validated, and usually typecast already to the appropriate types. And they might be augmented, maybe additional uh, features or um, columns might be added. And finally, you have your gold data sets. These are your fact and dimension. These are highly processed, highly optimized data sets that's ready for consumption. Now to extend the analogy of a data lake, your gold data sets is like your bottled water. Your bottled water is clean, it's convenient and ready for use. Now, you imagine your business user, that's the folks who's gonna be using your gold data sets. But I get, I get the question, why do we need the silver data sets? Well, that's for your data scientists. Your data scientists, typically, they don't wanna be um, concerned with the, the intricacies of the source systems like your raw data sets. They might still be interested and they, they don't really wanna do you know, converting your, your string, your date, date strings into actual dates. They want some sort of cleansed data set, but they don't also want a really processed data set. They still want the anomalies that, that exist within that data set. So the silver data set is the perfect data sets for your data scientists. Which bring me to the first learning within the pipeline, when you build your pipelines, is validate early in your pipeline. What do I mean by this? So going to the analogy of the, t of the data tiering, typically you wanna validate around here, right before you go into your silver. That way, once it's silver and onwards, you know that you can write code in your, in your data pipelines, which have certain assumptions with the data invariants that your validation logics, uh, logic actually um, make sure it, it holds. So you can write logic at this point so that any other code downstream can make that assumption that this, for example, column has this set, and set of codes in it, these columns are, will never be null, and so on and so forth. And from this validation logic, typically you'd have some rows that won't make through make through this validation logic. So you don't want to be dropping your data. You probably want to sync this some some sort of malformed record schema, and you obviously need to put on monitoring on this. So in case that this kind of blows up for some, whatever reason. Okay. So a question for a question that I get a lot is why not we validate here before we even hit the data lake. Well, we all know that code ne always works, right? Well, not really. So the problem with validating there is that you might introduce a bug and then you essentially um, tear down or p potentially corrupt the data sets in your data lake. So that brings me to my second learning is ensure your data pipeline is replayable. So going back to the data tiers, your bronze layer typically has almost zero transformation. It's just a copy over to your data lake. That way, you are the, the likelihood of introducing a bug which corrupts your data is very, very minimal. It's a append-only immutable store of data. And then your silver data sets, that's when you start your transformation, your validation. And your gold is your highly optimized uh, transform data set. So that way, if you do introduce a bug, and I am pretty sure it will happen, <coughs> Um, as we know, we're all not perfect, and you do corrupt your silver and gold, 
you can just replay your, your pipeline and then repopulate your silver and gold. That way you're not dropping data and you can actually reconstruct your silver and, and gold data sets. Okay, for the demo, I am gonna be using this uh, publicly available API, uh, which has been gracefully provided by the Melbourne government. So the Melbourne government actually has a bunch of sensors, parking sensors spread across the CBD. And these are in-ground sensors which, which detect if there's a, a vehicle parked or not. And this is all available in API. If you're interested, you can go to that link right here. And for the demo that I'll be, I'll be presenting, I'll be using this API as my source data. Um, now, the, the details of the data is not necessarily important. I do want everyone to be focusing more on the architecture of the data pipeline. So here's a sample of the modern data warehouse patterns actually in a concrete uh, data pipeline. So from left to right, we have the parking service. We have a copy job that actually lands it into the landing area or a landing schema. And then we have a cleanse and standardized job which takes this, this raw data and, trans and cleanses it and transforms it into what we call the silver data sets. But in this case, I'm calling it an interim schema. And there might be some malformed records that come along. So I put my, the bad data in that schema. And then I have a second transform job which takes this, transforms it to the data warehouse schema. And finally, I have a polybase. Um, I'm using polybase to actually take the data that's sitting in data lake and move it into SQL data warehouse. All of this is orchestrated using data factory. Okay, so let's jump into our demo. Okay, so I am here in Data Factory, and as you can see, this data pipeline is very similar to the one that I've, I've shown in my diagram. And for those who are new to Data Factory, data, this is the Data Factory uh, workspace, or wizard if you wanna call it, and you have a number of activities here that you can just drag and drop and author your pipelines all in this um, wizard. So the first step in my pipeline, I'm just setting a, a variable called set uh, in file folder. This is just a timestamp, so I'm timestamping my folders. And then I'm using the copy data activity, which basically reads from that REST API and then syncs into the data lake. And I'm using that timestamp right here, which is the file folder, the timestamp, which will be the, the name of the file folder it syncs into. So if we have a look at that in data lake, it looks like this. So we have the data lake in the landing schema, which is timestamped in this folder and we have two JSON files sitting in data lake. Nice and easy. Next job, we have the standardized data job, which is essentially a Databricks job. Uh, it calls a Databricks notebook, and the beauty of this is that it spins up a Spark cluster when it gets triggered and then tears it down afterwards. So it's quite cost efficient in that regard that you don't have a 24 hour Spark cluster running. And as you can see, I am calling this, Spark, uh, this notebook in this, um, path, let's navigate to that uh, notebook. So this is the, the Databricks workspace. Um, if you used Jupyter Notebooks before, it's very similar. It's a notebook sort of uh, way of coding. And um, I'm, own, I'm using Python, but Databricks can support Scala, SQL, and R. So you can write your data transformation in those three, uh, four languages. Okay. The first bit of code I have here is just a way of parameterizing notebook so that this notebook actually knows where, which, which files to actually pick up and read. And then I'm just setting that file path right here. And this is the bulk of the code. So the first line here is I'm, I'm, I'm importing a Python package that I've written. And I'll get into that in later parts of the demo. But essentially, that Python package has a set of functions that I'm calling in this set of code, in this code. I'm retrieving the schema that it expects. I'm using a spark.read and then filtering out the bad rows that don't conform to the schema that I expect into this file uh, folder. And then once I have my data frame, I'm calling standardized sparking bay and standardized sensor data, passing in the raw data frame and along with other variables. And it outputs a tuple of data frames, the first uh, the first data frame is your good rows, and the second data frame are your bad rows. These are my malformed records. And then the good rows go into my interim schema, and then the bad rows go into the malformed schema. So nice and simple, just read, transform, and load. Now, the next step is my transform data. The transform data is very similar. I have a parameter which just identifies which load is this. 
But instead of reading the JSON file sitting in Data Lake, I'm reading the interim schema that I populated in the previous job. Now in here, it's also very similar. I'm just calling, instead of standardized, I'm calling process dim parking bay data and so on. And I'm writing out to the data warehouse tables right here. That's for my dimension tables and I'm doing exactly the same with my fact tables. So very standard, very simple uh, transformation logic right here. And finally, I have a stored procedure uh, call within Data Factory where I'm calling a stored procedure called load data warehouse. So let's have a look at that. The load data warehouse uh, stored procedure looks like this. It's very simple. So I'm just truncating my dimension tables and reloading it by, why, via an insert into select star from external table, right? So it, the logic is quite simple. The magic here is that external table. What is this external table? So if you've ever used Polybase, this should look quite familiar. An external table is essentially a pointer to files in data lake. So you can see that I'm creating, an, the definition of this external table is I'm saying data source, data lake st storage, which I've defined, which has all the credentials that it needs to connect to that specific instance. And I'm saying, look for my data in this location. So let's have a look at that location. That location in data lake is essentially these. These are my parquet files. These are the files that underpin the Spark SQL tables that I've inserted in my previous transform job. So if Spark SQL tables all of, all of, is just a metadata pointer to the files that's actually sitting in Data Lake. Okay, so once that's run, we have data. And just a select star and there goes, there's my fact table data. Cool. So I'll just jump back to the presentation. Okay, so that wasn't really anything groundbreaking. That's a relatively straightforward pipeline. And to be fair to the modern data warehouse pattern, this, is, this pattern has been uh, proposed by Microsoft for the past few years now. The common question and the common uh, thing that folks and clients that I have worked with that have trouble with is how do you operationalize this? How do we move that entire thing to another environment? And the standard answer is? <laughs> okay, so let's, let's dig in deeper than just rubbing some DevOps on it. So DevOps essentially is the union of people, process, and product. Now this talk is a little bit focused on the product, but the people and process parts is definitely very important and integral to the DevOps process. And ultimately it's about doing the continuous delivery of value to your end users. How can we accelerate this value to the end users through um, potentially tools like CI, CD <coughs> and so on? Like the way I like to think about DevOps, and this is actually based on this blog post right here in the link, and I'll po post the, fly, uh, the slides up so you can have a read. But essentially, I like the, the way they've described it here where you think of the, da the data pipeline as a value pipeline, right? It's taking raw data raw uh, data sets and then converting them into valuable assets that your users can use. So in a way, it, it's, like, it, it's the continuous delivery of value in your data. Your data factory is a pipeline that continuously delivers value to your end users. However, this is not the only pipeline. We have a second pipeline called the innovation pipeline. And this is the pipeline that essentially updates your value pipeline so that any ideas, that, uh, that your, your data analyst or data engineers have can be deployed into production and then be used by your value pipeline to produce the best value for your users. Now there's a bit of duality here because you have two orchestrators. You have the orchestrator for your pipeline and you have the orchestrator for your innovation pipeline. So, and along with your testing, right? So your test, you have to test both your data and your pipeline. For your value pipeline, your data is changing but your value pipeline is not. While your innovation pipeline, your data is fixed. You're fi giving a, a fixed data while your innovation pipeline is changing. So there's, a, there's a, little, a little bit of complications of when you think about it, you just have to remember which part are you testing and which, part, which pipeline are you actually orchestrating. For the innovation pipeline, I'm using Azure pipelines um, as my CI CD mechanism. And Azure pipelines is part of the bigger Azure DevOps suite. 
Um, for example, Azure Boards, Azure Repos, Test Plans, and Artifacts, all of this is available in Azure DevOps, but we'll be focusing specifically just on Azure Pipelines. Okay, so going back to our little architecture, there's really three components really here that we need to automate. We have the Databricks jobs right here, your transformation, your notebooks, and that package that I was loading. We have SQL Data Warehouse, which have all your SQL schema, your, your the stored procedures, and all that sort of stuff. And then you have your actual pipeline, the data factory pipeline itself. Let's go through one of them at a time. So the first thing I want to focus is your Azure Databricks. Now, if, if you remember in the demo, I showed you that one line of code, which I was importing that package. That's actually quite fundamental in the way you structure your data transformation code. So data transformation codes belong in packages, not in notebooks. Now, this might seem obvious to, to folks coming from a software engineering background, but it's very common, uh, at least from my experience, to see you know, thousands of lines of code in a notebook. And it's very difficult to write unit tests if your code is in a notebook. So the, my advice to lots of folks when I see this is you want to really think about your transformation logic, what, which are really specific to transformation and which is specific to DAO or uh, data access code. And you rip out your transformation code and put it in a package so that it's now in, encapsulated where you can just call those functions within your notebook. That way you can actually write proper unit tests against your transformations. And Databricks also comes with um, de uh, integrated version control mechanisms. So you can wire up your notebook so that it wires up to Git, uh, GitHub, Azure DevOps, or Bitbucket. And it also comes with this uh, good CLI so that you can automate different uh, steps within your workspace or management of your workspace. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So I'm gonna jump into Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio or VS Code. And this is basically my Python package. So you can see that I have my functions, my get schema, my standardized parking da bay data. And all of that has all the Spark code encapsulated within it along with my validation code. That way, I can, actually, I can actually call and run my unit test. So I have a make file here. The make file has just uh, basically simplified the way I've run my tests. I can just simply say make test. So I'll just run that here. And this goes and triggers all my unit tests. So the unit test looks like this. I'm simply instantiating a Spark session locally. And Spark is open source, right? Spark can be installed locally in your box. It doesn't, you don't need to have a Databricks cluster running. And then I'm simply calling, I'm just simply reading a, a, a known data set that's saved locally, calling my function, and then doing some asserts. So now all of a sudden I can actually write proper unit tests against my, my, my data transformation code. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to show you is in Databricks, you can actually uh, integrate your notebook with source control. So there's two ways to actually bring down your files to your, to lo to your local uh, computer. One is you can just simply export it, that's the manual way, or you can do, click on revision history and then you can link it to Git. So I haven't linked this because I, I used a different way and you just simply add your um, details over here and it will link to your relevant Git repo. The way I like to do it, and this is more of a personal preference than anything else, is I just use the Databricks CLI. So the Databricks CLI, you can do a Databricks workspace export there, and it will export down your notebooks locally. And I also use a Databricks CLI in my CI CD pipelines to actually automate importing this into the workspace when I go into staging. Okay. Next, SQL Data Warehouse. So as there's this really wonderful tool called SQL Server Data Tools. And what this tool does is that it allows developers or data engineers to pull down your database objects locally. And not only that, you can also do a schema compare such that if anyone does some development on SQL Server Management Studio or someone changes the table definition, you can do a schema compare to the to your local instance or local code base, and it will pull down the diff between what is deployed in your server and what is what you have locally. Then you can actually generate something called a DAC pack. And the DAC pack is this nice package you can use to deploy and point to a different server, and it will incrementally update that server based on the diff between the DAC pack and what's deployed in that server. 
it comes with a CLI. Um, I do want to point out that the SQL data warehouse support is still in preview, so just, just take a note of that. But SQL, Azure SQL database has been supported on GA for, for many years now. So let's have a look, quickly look at SQL data tools. So I'm going to jump into Visual Studio. So this is actually a Visual, uh, Visual Studio. It comes out of the box with Visual Studio 2019. And I believe in 2017, you have to download the latest for SQL Data Warehouse support. And you can see here that all my, my SQL database uh, objects are in Visual Studio. So all of my sort procedures, my table definitions, and so on. And if I want to update the if let's say someone created the table, so for in, in this case, I created a sample table in my dev database, I can just do a schema compare and click compare and it will detect that someone created this a database and I can just click update and this will update this, the definitions locally. So it's a re really powerful way of making sure that you have the latest version of your SQL Server objects in source control. And the other cool thing about this is if I, if I do a build, this will try to validate of all my objects. So if you ever done database development and you're in a stored procedure which reference a, a table and someone dropped a column, your that's not your SSMS is not going to complain. You, and you'll find out later in production that your stored procedure is referencing a column that no longer exists. However, here when I do a build and that column doesn't exist, it will tell me that all, hey, hey, your store procedure is not consistent. You need to update your store procedure. So just simply doing a build is actually incredibly powerful. That build produces what I, I mentioned earlier is your DACPAC file. And this DACPAC file is what I'm going to be using in my CIC pipeline to deploy to my stage and my production environments. OK, so coming back to the slides. So the next thing that I want to focus on is Data Factory. So Data Factory also comes with its own Git integration. So as you can see here, it integrates with GitHub or Azure DevOps repos out of the box. And you can just select your GitHub account, what repository, the collaboration branch, which is essentially which branch can you publish changes to, your, to the fa factory that it's linked to, and which folder you want to actually pull the, or save the artifacts that Data Factory creates. Oops, sorry. Okay, once you've actually wired up a uh, data factory, this is the, the, the recommended way of actually using the artifacts or the flow that you would undertake to do CI CD using your data, uh, the, ins um, the artifacts within data factory. So typically you would create your data factory that's synced to a dev branch, your, which, is, which we call the working branches. And once you're happy, you do a pull request to master. And this is essentially your collaboration branch. This is the branch where you can publish changes to your dev, your dev factory. Now, your dev factory then, once you publish the changes, your dev factory syncs automatically the ARM templates for this data factory into a publish branch. This publish branch by default is called ADF publish. And this ADF publish has your ARM templates which we, you can then use as an artifact to your release definition. When you create a release, you just pick up these ARM templates and then parameterize them with the correct uh, parameters, and you can deploy these ARM templates to the relevant environments, such as um, test or prod or pre-prod and so on. So let's have a look at what um, that looks like. So I'll just jump to Data Factory. I am already, I've already uh, integrated um, this pipeline, but if I haven't done so, this is how you do it. So you just go to, this is the landing pit portion of, of Data Factory, and you just click on Setup Code Repo, and then you just click GitHub, and then you fill up the relevant details. But once you've done that, you should see something like this. So you can see that I'm on my dev branch. So any changes I do here, I, it will automatically sync when I hit save. So let's have a quick change here and say, hello from NDC Sydney. And when I hit save, this will automatically sync to my dev branch. So how do I want to publish this? I will then go and create a pull request. And you can see that the pull request has detected my change, and I just go and create the pull request. I won't create the pull request just yet. I'll, I'll do that in the later demos. But I do want to show you 
the other thing here, which is your master branch. Once I go to my master branch, and this is the only branch where I can actually publish changes into, uh, into your deploy data factory. Now, the master branch, whatever you publish from the master branch creates this branch called ADF publish. This is your publish branch. This is automatically maintained by data factory. What is in this branch are your ARM templates. So if I go into this folder, this is my ARM template that I can use to deploy data factory. So for those who are not familiar with ARM templates, this is essentially Azure's way of doing infrastructure as code. So it's a big JSON file which tells exactly how to deploy the pipelines of your data factory within Azure. Okay, so jumping back to the slides. Are we done? Is that all we need? Not yet. We still have some configuration to do. We're, what happens to all the connection string, right? Well, how, how do you wire up all the connection strings of, of data factory, the keys of, of data lake and all that sort of stuff? That's when Key Vault comes in. So Key Vault is this uh, service in Azure where you can use to securely store any relevant secrets or certificates that your applications might use. The great thing about Key Vault, it, it comes with integrations with various Azure services. One is Data Factory. So in Data Factory, you can create a Key Vault service, linked service, which can be used to pull the secrets from Key Vault and then use with other linked services. For example, your, your uh, linked services which connect to, to Data Warehouse. Same with Databricks, uh, you can also create a Key Vault backed secret scope which then is essentially a set of secrets within a scope in, in Databricks, which mirror whatever is in Key Vault. And finally, in Azure, um, in Azure Pipelines, you can create something called a variable group, which is also linked to Key Vault, and you can bring in secrets from Key Vault within a variable group, so you can use within your pipelines. So let's just see, have a look what that looks like in Data Factory. So in Data Factory, if I go to, to my connections, you can see I have a Key Vault link service. This Key Vault link service is referencing my Key Vault, and I've already uh, authenticated the MSI, the managed identity of Data Factory to Key Vault so that it's authorized to pull the secrets from that specific Key Vault. So my Dev Factory is authorized to pull from the Dev Key Vault and my stage from the stage and so on and so forth. Once that's rigged up, I can simply in my linked service for my, my data factory, so this is my data warehouse linked service, it's simply using that linked service of Key Vault and pulling down the relevant secrets. The beauty of this is as you move across environments, all you need to do is update your Key Vault URL and your link service is pull automatically the secrets relevant to that environment, as long as your secret name is, is uniform across all the environments. So it's a really elegant way of swapping over different environments. Okay, so I think we are ready to do a sample release. This is how we're gonna do it. So we have a build pipeline, which is the purpose of it is do a, doing some QA. So it's running my unit tests, some linting, building my DAC pack, uh, building so that it validates the DAC pack and so on. That will get triggered on any pull request to master. And then any commit to master will run the second part of the build pipeline, which will build my DAC pack, will, build, will create the wheel file for the Python package, along with publishing the artifacts, so my notebooks, my data, uh, my, uh, any other scripts that's relevant to my pipeline. Now, this produce all, produces all the build artifacts, and I'm using also that ADF publish branch, the one with my ARM templates as a build artifacts, artifact, which will then feed into my release pipeline. So the release pipeline then will deploy to stage and to prod. For the demo, I'll only do the deploying to stage for simplicity purposes. But you can imagine you have a key vault that's specific to each environment. And the, the pipelines will be pulling from this key vault, uh, the, the key vault relevant to that environment for the specific, for the configurations needed to deploy. Okay, so let's jump into the demo. Okay, so I'm gonna first show you the pipeline. So here's the pipeline that's sitting here. It's not yet running. 
But once I go into my pull requests and actually create a pull request, and I'll say, yep, create a pull request. There's probably gonna be a code review process and so on and so forth. But you can see that it's now triggered a bunch of um, pipelines to validate my PR. So let's have a look at my pipeline. There should be a pipeline coming up. So you can see now it's queued and it should be running in one second. So here it's running the first stage of that pipeline. So let's have a look at the first stage. That's the validate PR stage. And it's validating my Python packages and my SQL packages. So while that's running, let's have a look at the definition of my build artifact, a build pipeline. My, the build pipelines are all defined in YAML. So YAML, uh, it build pipe, Azure pipelines in the relatively latest release, you can, you can define your pipelines all in YAML. So the first job here, uh, sorry, first stage is my validate PR stage. So let me just open that up. And you, see, you can see here that I am triggering when the reason is a pull request. So only trigger this part if I'm doing a pull request. Within it, I have two jobs, the validate Python and validate SQL packages. So in my first job, I am simply installing any dependencies that my package needs to build. I am running some linting and I'm running my unit tests, very simple. Now my second job is simply doing a VS build. So the, if you think about it, your SQL Server database project is just a simple v Visual Studio project. So it follows the same pattern of actually building it. So I'm just doing a NuGet restore just in case uh, someone wants to put NuGet packages in the solution. I'm doing a build. I'm doing some tests if I have unit tests. And, and that's it. So that basically validates that my DAC pack can actually build and can actually pass the unit tests. Okay, so I can see that my pipeline has, should be all complete by now. If not, let's just have a look. Okay, it's still running. Okay, let's give it a little bit more. It should be completing in the next few seconds. But let's jump first to the next, ne next stage, which is essentially when I commit to master, what will happen? So this is, pu this is actually publishing the artifacts. Now, one of the most important conditions here is you do not want to publish artifacts unless it's from the master branch. Because uh, this is a common thing that I find sometimes is that you're publishing artifacts even if it's just pull requests. You don't want to do that because then you can really uh, create a release from unvalidated code. So you just want to publish when it's on master. And you can see I have three other jobs here, which is my Python package, my static artifacts, and my SQL packages. So before I just continue there, let me just double check. Okay, cool, that's done. Let me merge that in. So I have my, my, my pull requests have been validated. I can just mer merge that pull request into master. Now this should trigger the second part of the build. Now, once it's actually merged into master, so I am here in the pipeline on my master branch. And if I do a refresh, I should see the text pop out in the description. There you go, hello from NBC Sydney, because that's the master branch. Now I'm gonna publish this, this, art of this pipeline to my dev data factory, and you can see that it's trying to figure out the diff between what is published and what is not. It's figured out, oh, I've updated the pipeline description. I'm gonna hit okay. This is gonna deploy the data factory to my dev data factory, cool. And it's gonna generate the ARM templates in the ADF publish branch. So these are the ARM templates are getting updated in that branch the ADF published branch, which then I can use in my, my deployment pipelines. Great. Okay, so once that's done, it should trigger the second release. So you can see that's run a second part of my build pipeline. So that's running, and within that, it's running the package, the, the remaining part of my build pipeline. So if I go back to my build pipeline, let's just look at what that looks like. And that's basically, um, essentially uh, doing exactly the same as the, pipe, uh, the Python packages. So I'm installing, installing the requirements in order to, to build it. I'm calling make disk, my make file, and a make file basically just creates the wheel package. In Python world, it's a wheel package. In .NET world, it's a DLL. So it's same, same analogy. So that's creating the wheel package. And I'm just doing some, some simple versioning here. And I'm, I'm setting the patch version as my build ID so that, so that it increments 
every time I do a build. And then finally, I just do a publish build artifact step, which basically publishes this as a build artifact. So that's my Python package. The static artifacts is that I have a number of other artifacts that I'll be using in my release pack, uh, pipeline. You can simply just publish this as is. So these are my notebooks. These, this, this Databricks bit is my, uh, the, the Databricks notebooks. And this one is a deployment script that I'll be using for my data factory publish. It's a deployment ADF, it's a PowerShell script, which I will be explaining once I get to the release par portion. And then finally, you have your SQL packages. So your SQL packages, this is your DAC pack. So I'm simply doing a build. I am running my tests again, if just, just for kicks. <laughs> um, and then I'm finally doing a publish build, and I'm publishing that specific DAC pack. OK, so let's have a look at our run. OK, so it's still going. So you can see um, in, Azure, in Azure DevOps, you can inspect the jobs as it runs through, and you can get all the logs as it, goes, uh, as it runs through the, the pipelines. OK, so once that's re I'll, I'll leave it there for now, and I will just jump back to the slides while, that, while that's still running. Well, actually, uh, before I jump to the slides, let's let's actually look at the release. So I'm, once this is done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be creating a release. So the release is now going to take the artifacts that the build has created, and then publish this as um, as into my stage and my prod uh, uh, environments. So the stage and prod environments look like this. So I have already my stage and prod resource groups. And the one that I'm going to be publishing is to the stage, so let's have a look at that. And it already has the relevant uh, artifacts within uh, that's already pre-deployed. So you have the Databricks workspace, uh, you'd have your data factory and key vault and so on. So there you go. So these are the, we already have a bunch of artifacts sitting there. And this is the staging data factory that we are publishing to. And we want to expect that once the release completes, We'll have the text sitting here. OK, so let's have a look back in there in the, OK, it's st still going. It's a little slow today. Usually that takes in two minutes. I'll pause here just to take any questions, because we do need to wait for this to finish to kick off the release. No questions, OK. <laughs> Let's, let's just look at the release definition while that's going. OK, so we have three stages. And this is what a release pipeline goes. I'll, I'll let me just go back one step further. So if I go to release pipeline and click edit, you can see that I am pulling from two artifacts. From my data pipeline CI artifact, the build pipeline, and also the ADF published branch. This is my git, the ADF git, uh, git branch that uh, I showed you earlier. So ADF publish. And then in my stage, so you can create a stage. This is deploying to, to the staging environment. I have three jobs or agent jobs. The first agent job deploys to Databricks. So the first step within this job, I'm simply just setting the Python version. And then I'm using, I'm installing the Databricks CLI in the build agent. And then I am using the this Databricks CLI to actually upload any app library, so my wheel package into DBFS, and then the notebooks to my workspace. So once that's uploaded, I can, that, that essentially you've already deployed your notebooks and your packages. The way your Databricks workspace actually deploys to the correct environment is using environment variables. So here I am setting the Databricks host and token and this host and token basically tells the CLI which workspace to de deploy to. And this workspace and token is coming from a bunch of variables, my build variables, or my release variables. So let's have a look at the variables here. The variables are all set in the variables tab in Azure DevOps. Some of them are not necessarily secret, so I'm just putting them straight up here in the variables. But I'm also pulling 
some variables from key vault. So these are my secrets, right? So two of the secrets that I'm pulling is the domain and token. This is the host and token of my Databricks workspace. Okay, so let me just, okay, cool. The, the package has been published, so that's great. Let us now just make sure that that's, okay. Let's create a release. So this, when you do a create release, you can either trigger it manually and you can select the specific version of the, of the build pipeline that you wanna actually release. And you can also set up CI CD so that once there's a new artifacts uh, actually available, it will trigger the release automatically. Now I do find that lots of folks um, that I work with typically want some manual or manual steps within the release. So you can definitely put some manual validation gates so that it blocks in certain stages for someone to actually verify the release has got, uh, is actually good. So let me create that release and that would go and queue up the release. So let's just jump back to the release pipeline. Now the second part of the release pipeline, so we've talked about the Databricks bit. The second part is data factory. So data factory is your just standard ARM template, right? So the ARM template deployment resource, uh, ARM Azure resource group deployment task is perfectly suitable for this. This basically takes the ARM template that we, that's produced by the ADF publish and deploys it to a relevant resource group. In this case, the staging resource group. The most important part of this is essentially this guy. You wanna override the template parameters, right? So you wanna make sure that you're actually overriding the, the parameters in your ARM template that was pointing to dev and make sure that you're actually pointing to staging. So once you've overrided the parameters to the correct um, R, uh, data factory, it should deploy to that environment, yes? Yep, so this, this guy incremental. So incremental means it will always do an incremental change. It won't drop and recreate. But you can change that to complete, which will drop and recreate. So obviously not to do that. Obviously. <laughs> you have a exactly, so you do not want to do a complete because yes, it will dip, drop whatever is in that resource group and make sure it conforms to that ARM template. Right, okay. And this other steps that, you're, that I've added here, which I haven't really talked about, this one basically just stops and, and restarts the trigger because there's this quirk in data factory where you can't deploy to an existing data factory if you haven't stopped the triggers. So you need to manually, or quote unquote, manually stop the triggers, deploy your data factory, and then restart the triggers. So that's what that PowerShell script was, is doing in my build pipeline. That PowerShell script, by the way, is available in Azure Docs. So I just literally just copy pasted it. So they've, they've, they know that this scenario exists, so they've provided it um, to everyone. And lastly, we have the DAC pack task. So the DAC pack task, as you imagine, I'm taking the DAC pack and just using that and deploying it to the relevant server. Now this DAC pack, the cool thing here is that you can override or you can set variables that, or parameterize your DAC pack deployments. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm parameterized the ADLS location and credential. So just if I just look into my, um, into what that looks like, in my script, I've actually parameterized this location um, setting in my external data source. That way I can pass the parameter when I deploy and it will, it will point to the relevant data lake. Okay, so I am hoping that my release pipeline is almost done, but if it's not, that's okay. I, th I have one last thing to show, which I think is still very important and I th lots of people kind of miss, is monitoring. So monitoring, I know lo lots of people like to focus on the CI CD bit when we talk about DevOps, but monitoring is just as important. In fact, I think when you go into production, this is, will be the most important thing that you can actually have. So you wanna monitor your infrastructure, pipeline, and data. Don't forget your data. Um, Azure Monitor is this all in very, very feature-rich monitoring suite on Azure. It comes with all of these uh, services here, and I obviously don't have talk, um, time to talk about everything, but I will be focusing on how you actually monitor your data, because this is something that lots of people kind of miss. So while my release is still going, let's jump to monitoring. 
And I'll just go to my notebook again. And I didn't scroll all the way to the end because there's this metrics piece of code right here. This metrics piece of code is using App Insights. So I'm instantiating a telemetric client using the App Insights library. And then I'm doing a count on the data frames that I've loaded. That way I can track how many records I've loaded and expose this in a dashboard. Now you can add even more sophisticated monitoring. For example, are there nulls? What's, this, what's the average of this, this column? And so on and so forth, right? And then you can send that to application insights as a metric. And then you can then post this in the dashboard so that you can know if there's bad data coming in. I, I would. I would also definitely track my malformed count. So if that goes up, you can send an alert if we all of a sudden you have a spike in bad rows that's coming through your pipe. So once you've set that up, this will run every time your notebook job runs. Then you can just navigate to application insights. So this is application insights. And if I go to the metric namespace, and you can see I have a custom metric namespace right here. I'm just gonna go select that and all my metrics that I'm capturing is available here for me to chart. So if I go here, I, I wanna do a bar chart and um, I'll make it sum of all the records that's been loaded in the past every run. And you can see they're, sl they're slowly adding new dimensions to my dimension tables. And I can just simply till pin that to my current dashboard and if I view my dashboard, this is what it looks like. So I have my row counts of the different dimensions, and this is the new thing that I've pinned. So you can definitely build sophisticated dashboards uh, using the Azure Monitor Suite. The other thing that I quickly wanna show you is you can also use Custo. So once you have your data factory, so this is my data factory, you can go to diagnostic settings, go to diagnostic settings, and you can enable diagnostic settings here and send your diagnostic settings to log analytics. Now, once you have your logs flowing into Azure data, uh, into log analytics, you can use Custo, which is a query language available in Azure, data, uh, Azure, um, Azure log analytics, to actually write sophisticated queries to, cr to expose this into your dashboard. So this is a relatively simple query, but you, can, you get the gist. So I'm just, some, I'm just fil filtering the logs based on my specific resource and I'm just doing a group by in Custo, it's called summarize, count by level, and level is the type of log. In this case, I don't have any errors, it's all informational logs, but if there were errors, so it's, it's gonna show up here, and it will. I can then post this into my dashboard, which I've already done. So this is basically saying, uh, that should be a pie chart, but I think it's my browser resolution is kind of screwing up with the rendering, but that should be a pie chart saying 72 uh, good runs have been performed. Okay. So I am hoping my release pipeline, okay, cool, it's done. So now if I navigate to my staging data factory, so this is my staging data factory, and if I refresh this, uh, refresh this <laughs> I have hello from NDC Sydney. Cool, deployed to stage, awesome. All right, so just to summarize, the key learnings is you wanna validate early your pipeline, push your validation right before you hit your silver, silver tier data sets. Ensure your data pipeline is replayable, and a, AKA you wanna build idempotent pipelines. You, because you know things will go wrong, you will wanna be able to replay your pipelines. Oh, okay. Um, the first one was leverage data tiering in the data lake. Um, and automate your deployment pipelines. Now there's an asterisk here because I know s certain organizations want some manual steps, manual validation step, and that's totally fine with, if that's their process. But it's definitely good if you have at least a run sheet or a CI CD pipeline to get you partial to the, all the way, or at least 90% of the way. Ensure your data transformation code is testable, so you can write proper unit test. Secure and centralize your configuration and Last but not the least is monitor infrastructure pipelines and data. All the artifacts that I've shown here is available in my GitHub. You can just go to GitHub DevLace Data DevOps and all of that I, I've shown, including some deployment scripts, ARM templates, notebooks, Python packages are all uh, in here. And that is my talk. So if you can reach me at, at Twitter or you can navigate to GitHub, I do have other demos in GitHub if you're interested. And with that, I think I have around five minutes for questions. 
Yes. How long does it take you to set that up? Set, oh, okay, that's a good question. <laughs> so this talk has been in the making for the past few months, but I, it's not like I've been working on it you know, 24, you know, every, every day on this talk. So I actually gave an iteration of this talk maybe in July and in May, but it was a much shorter talk. So I've already built out those artifacts. Maybe in total, I'd say a week or two of work, um, mostly because the, the transformation logic was fairly simple. And if you're familiar with the services, it should be relatively, it's just an exercise of just setting it up, right? So th I think the biggest roadblock to this is there's so many moving parts and there's so many different services that's involved that every one of them, if you haven't played with it, will, there, will have a learning curve. So that's probably what, if you're familiar with already the individual parts, putting them all together shouldn't be that painful. Any other questions? No? Well, lastly, please make sure to put a green post-it as you go out. <laughs> if not, let me know, give me some feedback. What can be better with my talk? Uh, reach, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, but with that, thank you all for coming and hope you enjoyed your talk. The talk.